Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, especially Mahan, for the very nice invitation to this very nice campus and country. So I will give a mini course on some recent progress on the topic of harmonic measures and Poisson boundaries for runner walks and groups. So I will start defining, of course, what these objects are. And so today I will uh, give a, mostly an overview. So I will uh, give a general overview of what the questions that people look at in this field. And then I will state the two results that I, I want to present. And I must say that, yeah, so my groups, yeah, will not be always hyperbolic groups, but they will always be groups that have some hyperbolic flavor. So this is uh, my most, um, yeah, the, the core of, of my interest. And so it's either hyperbolic groups or groups that act nicely on some hyperbolic space. And then the, in the third lecture, I will give a proof of a new um, identification theorem about Poisson boundary for certain groups, including hyperbolic groups. And then I will, uh, in the last lecture, I will talk more in detail about the proof of a result about singularity of harmonic measure on certain Fuchsian groups. Okay, so let's start. What is, uh, so what is the topic that we have? So we have for us G, fortunately Gabor used gamma for G group and G for graph. I will use G for group. So G, G be a countable group. And then we put a measure a probability measure on this group. So again, the group is countable, so let's not uh, go into technicalities, it's just an atomic measure. Okay. So, and then what is a, well, the random walk is the following, so, is the process where we start taking randomly uh, elements of G according to this probability measure, but then we multiply them together. So is the process, so the process is defined like this, we call it Wn, the product of G1, G2, and such elements, where we draw Gn independently and with the same distribution mu. So, so R dependent, identically distributed elements of G. And the law is this mu. So if you're not familiar with the language of probability, it will be even, even clearer pretty soon. What do we mean? But the idea is, for instance, if mu is measure supported on two elements with this, we pick randomly one of these two elements, and this is G1. Then we put it back in the urn, and we pick G2 independently, and, and so forth. And we obtain this sequence Gn. So these are independent and identical. But then it's interesting to look at the composition. And remember that this group need not be abelian. So if we look, if we look at an abelian group, it's like the sum of independent random variables. So this is the classical setup of probability. Like if we do it in a group, we do product instead of sum. And of course the order also matters because this is not an abelian group necessarily. Okay, so more uh, even informally, we want to introduce the following spaces. So we have two spaces. So we have a, what's called the step space. So the step space is the product space of Gn with the product measure mu to the n. And so this is the space where this GIs live. So we think of GIs as the increments of our random walk. So this is the space where the GN lives. These are called increments. And again, the fact that we take the product measure means indeed that these increments are independent and identically distributed. And then we define another space, so which is the path space. So we consider the following map, P from Gn to itself. So as a set is the same, but the measure would be different. So we map the sequence Gn to the sequence Wn, which is the product, right? 
So we get another sequence, and we let, okay, we define P the probability that we care about as the push forward of this probability under uh, of the product probability under this map. So basically, the distribution of the WN will be called PN. The distribution of WN. And so the space, so the space omega equals GN. So we will denote the this new space omega with probability P is called now this this is the path space. So you see the difference is the increments live on this space and the locations of the walk live on that space. This is important not to confuse the two. So in general, we care about this space. Okay, so again, examples you, that you have probably seen. So the classical setting of probability, for instance, if G is the group Z, and then we can make it act. Oh yeah, and in general, the other thing we, we care about most of the time is we let G act isometrically on a some metric space on X, D, symmetric space. And for us, most of the time, X will be a hyperbolic space in the sense of Gomov. So like near the um, defined last week, but in general, okay, it need not be. And so, and we take O a base point, okay? And then we consider what we call a sample path, which is given by taking this random group element and apply it to this, um, to this base point. So usually the picture that you want to have in mind is something like this. You start with the base point O, and then you have W1 of O, W2 of O, WN. So the order of multiplication, it seems weird. I anticipate that because we multiply group elements on the right and we act on the left. However, this is the only way in which you can make sense of this theory. I mean, the whole theory starting from Furstenberg is developed in this setting. Okay, so the examples. So again, if you start with G equals Z, this will act on for instance, the real line just by translations. And then if you take as base point, just um, zero for instance, okay, you can take for instance, the measure one half concentrated to plus one with measure probability one half and minus one with probability one half. Okay, this gives the usual simple random walk on the line that we all love or hate, I don't know. So the zero you have. The two moves, so that's that's just a classical simple random. And of course, if you you can change this measure to make this walk, uh, you know, biased to go towards the right or towards the left, if it just happens. But of course, you can have many more complicated things. You can have your steps to be supported on a much larger set, so you can allow steps of length ten or two hundred. And also you can allow steps of unbounded length, provided that the total sum of the weights is one. So this also could be. So in fact, one of the two results will be on finitely supported measures, but the other one will be on measures with infinite moment. So <laughs> that, that it's important also that you allow yourself to have this very large jumps. Okay, and in a more hyperbolic situation, of course, you could get the free group, for instance. Of course, uh, you can, Think of it being generated by A and B, and then you can think of the Kelly graph with respect, for instance, uh, the standard generating set and B. And yeah, this one, of course, is a four valent tree. And then, for instance, we can take mu to be 
the measure one quarter delta of A plus delta of A inverse plus delta of B plus delta of B inverse. This would be one possibility. And then you have just the good old run walk on a four valent tree. Okay, you can put O at the center, for instance, and you go A or A inverse, B or B inverse. And eventually, you, you could tell that the geometry of the space on which you're acting will matter. In fact, that's where the negative curvature comes in. So it turns out that, for instance, if you do a random walk on z or z square, you would have that the random walk is recurrent. So it comes back to the same starting point infinitely often. But it turns out that if you do it on the free group, well, this is not the case. And in fact, the random walk will go to infinity. And in fact, it will go to infinity with positive speed. And this is, in, in some sense, feature of the, of the negative curvature. So we will get more, more clearly into that. Of course, uh, if you do a random walk on z cube, that is still transient, but the drift would be zero. So let, let, let's get more into that later. OK, so and the other example that we, we really love is when you have g to be a subgroup of PSL2R, because this is indeed the group of isometries of the hyperbolic two space. And so we take O to be, uh, you know, to be, for instance, I, and then you have X to X, X, H2, and this is exactly the picture that I already drew here. And then, yeah, of course, the action is given by the Mebius action, Mebius transformations. So each element here is a, is a matrix. And so we can pick two matrices, for instance, you take A and B, two, two matrices in, say, SL2. And then, for instance, you can consider the random walk where you do pick the matrix A with probability one half and the matrix B with probability one half. This would be one, one option. And uh, yeah, in that case, what is WN? Well, WN is just a product. You do A a bunch of times and B a bunch of times and so forth. Something like this, N times. And so we will see later with her a, a examples of, of. Okay. So uh, yeah, also let me um, tell you that this, this spaces on which the group acts need not be. So nice, so these spaces so far were locally compact, for instance, so finite dimensional, but it could be also infinite dimensional. So for instance, group we would care about is the infinite, is the group, the free group on infinitely many generators. And in that, again, we take the Cayley graph with say the standard free generating set. Well, this one is an infinite valence tree. And so this space is still delta hyperbolic because it's a tree. So if you pick three points, well, the only triangle that you could um, connect, you, you can use to connect them is, 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 an, is a tripod. So it's even zero hyperbolic. But uh, yeah, but this space is, is not locally compact, for instance, and it's not not proper. So proper means that um, yeah, closed balls are not not and if you're a geometric topologist, you, you probably have seen several hyperbolic graphs or hyperbolic complexes on which some interesting group acts, for instance, the mapping class group acting on a curve complex or outer fan acting on various complexes. So this is becoming more interesting from that point of view. Okay. So let me um, write what are typical questions that we want to ask of this random world. So first of all, okay, the question that I already alluded to is, so if do typical sample path Escape to infinity. And this is the classic 
dichotomy. So we have that random walk, let's say is, let's say that random walk is recurrent. So I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but if let's say on, on a group, if for every G, the probability that Wn equals G infinitely often one, and otherwise it's transient. And of course, yeah, we know that for instance, the Z to the, uh, the simple random walk on Z to the D is recurrent if and only if D is one or two. But for instance, we will see that the simple random walk on, on some free group on FK is always transient. However, this is still not distinguishing between the nature of this geometry, which is a flat geometry essentially, so you have a grid, and this geometry, which is a hyperbolic geometry. So hyperbolic geometry has even stronger features. So, so, so what is the next type of questions that we can ask? Well, we can say if uh, does, yeah, so if the random walk have positive speed, And usually, sometimes we call the speed drift. So, so how do we define the speed or drift? Well, so to be precise, we have to assume that you have finite first moment. So meaning that the integral of the distance, so the average of the possible distances that you're moving in one step is finite. So this is just actually a series, but they write it as integral. Okay. Okay, then, yeah, then we can, we can um, define the drift as the following L, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the distance between the n step of the runner walk and the origin divided by n. So in fact, this one exists almost surely. So this would be, this is an application of, of Kingman's subadditive theorem. So this would be a um, nice exercise, but in any case, for almost every sample path, you have this, the speed exists and it's always the same number. And so, and so the, the, the question, important question that people ask is, is L positive or not? And for instance, again, if you, if you have a simple random walk on say ZD, well, in this case, the drift is always zero, no matter what dimension is. So the random walk does escape to infinity, but sort of very slowly. However, if you do the simple random walk say on the free group on two generators, well, then L indeed is, is positive. And in fact, this is an exercise that you can definitely think about to prove that. Well, the, the hint is the following. So yeah, so prove that L in fact is one half. Well, the hint is that if you look at the distance, so the end is the distance between the end step of the walk and the origin in your free group. So if you are here, for instance, so the n would be the distance after n steps. Well, the expectation of the n plus one, well, well, what is it? Well, 
basically, if you're not at the origin, well, you have three options to increase your distance and one option to decrease your distance. So in general would be, this is in fact, yeah, would be bigger than, <laughs> because if you're at zero, it's even better. So you have three, three over four, four probability of increasing your distance to do dn plus one. And then you have one quarter probability of doing my, to going back. And so three quarter minus one quarter, this is one half. So this is bigger than patient of the n plus one half. So if you know that this limit, this, this divided by n exists, then you see that it has to be this one half. And in fact, it's exactly one half. So this is a bit slightly cheaper. Okay, maybe are there any questions so far? Here, yeah. Sorry? Uh, yeah, in general, well, usually you can, well, let's think of graphs for the moment. I mean, if you have action on a graph, yeah, you, 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 you can give the same definition for, for a graph. Of course, if you're acting on a, on a, you know, on a, on a manifold, well, you're not, your, your random work will be supported on a countable subset of the manifold. So you have to define it maybe differently using open sets. Sorry? Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So, right. So, yeah, being transient means that it escapes every, every, um, every compact set. So at some point, for given the compact set, whatever compact set you fix, you're, you're going to be outside of this compact set forever. And if you, yeah, the thing is, if you have a probability of returning, then you do it again, right? If the probability of returning once is one, then you can do it again. And, and you, you get the probability of returning twice is also one. And so the probability of returning infinitely often. So this is a consequence of the Markov property of the work. Does that make sense? Sorry? Which metric? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 of course, the, the metric on G and the metric on X are, are different, I agree. So this would be the definition for G acting on itself, yes. But of course, if you, if you act on a, yeah. More questions? Okay, so. Okay, so what's going on? So, yeah. So the next the next property, so that is good in in, um, in negative curvature, is not just even that the drift is positive, but further. So I have it as condition three. Question three is that does the random walk converge to a suitable compactification or bordification? Of X. Yeah, the reason why I say bordification is because in the long locally compact case, the boundary that one can construct will not be compact. So you 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 don't necessarily have compactification that is relevant, but you, you might have bordification. But in any case, so in fact, and that is true in this hyperbolic situation. So this is a theorem that in different levels of generalities, of course, has been known for a long time in, uh, say, the matrix case. So, Furstenberg 
proved it already for, for uh, you know, the matrix cases. And then, for instance, we can cite Kalmanovich for hyperbolic groups. And then the most general statement is due to Mahar and myself on any delta hyperbolic space, including, importantly, the non-locally compact ones. And the fact is, due to the negative curvature, indeed, the random walk will pick a direction. So almost surely, the random walk will converge to certain point on the boundary. So of course, the random walk can wander a little bit. But uh, somehow, there will be a limit point to this random sequence. And this will be, you know, will depend on the random path. But all but surely, there will be some direction the walk is converging. And so this is the statement. So let me, so we have let mu be a non elementary measure, which I will define afterwards, uh, the theorem on, on, a, on a countable G, uh, right? So group of isometries, group of isometries of hyperbolic metric space, uh, delta hyperbolic. So this is the only conditions that we need. So we need that the support of this measure is large enough that it sees, yeah, most, most of the spaces. Okay, and so then for almost, yeah, then for any, for every base point in X, for almost every sample path WN, the limit of the sample path exists. So the limit WNO, which we can say psi. So this limit is a, is a point in the boundary of X. Yeah, exists. And exists in the, in the Gromov boundary of X. So the boundary of X for X hyperbolic space, for all these lectures, we will consider the Gromov boundary. So this in the Gromov boundary And again, this is also true when you have a non-proper space where it's more complicated because the random walk can sort of potentially escape along this uh, you know, infinite sequence of branches that you're not taking care of, but indeed it's not the case. So what does non-elementary mean? So recall the following. So we have a bunch of definitions. So yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, it's in the limit set because it's an accumulation point of the orbits. Yeah. Yeah, next uh, statement I will define the harmonic measure. Yeah. 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 So, any other questions? So I think I should define more precisely what non elementary means. So what does non-elementary mean? Well, so yeah, so first of all, we have to refer, so okay, let again, G be a group of isometries of X, X, where this is delta hyperbolic. By the way, who knows the definition of delta hyperbolic? Okay, everyone, good. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, so then what? So yeah, so so we have the classification of, of isometries in particular. We say that so a, an element G in G is called the loxodromic if what L of G, which is the stable translation length, which is the following, 
So the distance between the base point and the nth iterate, okay, this always exists, but it's positive. If it's positive, this is called loxodromic. And if so, so if this is the case, then G has two fixed points. on the boundary of x. So the situation is the following that you have O, a loxodromic element means that you, you're, you're making definite progress in the direction of G. So, so basically the picture looks like that. So it has two fixed points. It doesn't need to preserve a geodesic if the space is not a manifold, or, but still there is some sort of axis direction. So there's two fixed points, one repelling and one attracting. And then we say that, so we say that uh, a measure mu is non-elementary if yeah, so now we have to define the group generated by its support. So, or even say, if the semigroup generated by the support of mu contains two loxodromic elements, which are independent. So which means G and H such that the fixed point sets are disjoint. So the fixed point sets of G and the fixed point sets of H are disjoint. So in particular, there will be another element H, which maybe acts like that. So there will be another fixed point. So this would be H, so H maybe acts like that. So these are four different fixed points. And in particular, obviously, by ping pong lemma, yeah, such a group will contain three groups. So definitely, we are already in a non, very non-amenable situation. So, okay. And uh, what else do we want to say? So, uh, right. So this is the definition of non-elementary. And so that's, but that's all that is needed for this convergence to the boundary. So we don't, for instance, we don't need any moment conditions for, for this uh, result to hold. And so the next step as Mahan anticipated is indeed that we can define this famous harmonic measure or hitting measure. So, right. Oh, by the way, and also we can remark let me remark that for matrices, which is maybe more familiar to some people, if you do this for matrices, this, of course, is an old result of Furstenberg. So if we look at G in PSL2R, so just acting on the good old hyperbolic plane, then, yeah, then mu is non-elementary. As long as the support, the group generated by the support of mu is not conjugate into one of the following groups. So you have a, you can do rotation. So for instance, rotation around I. So this would be, of course, so this would be purely elliptic situation. Or you could have a purely loxodromic, purely hyperbolic situation. Or you could have a purely parabolic situation like that. So these are cases where obviously you don't expect such a result to be true, because in this case, you're, the whole group is rotating around the base point. So definitely you're not going to have any convergence to the boundary. In the second case, well, you're, you're going on a geodesic up and down. So it's basically a random walk on R. So then it depends whether it's balanced or not. And you could, you could have 
uh, converges to the boundary or not, but uh, it's a different question. And well, in this case, means you're fixing one base po one point on the boundary, and so you're going around a horror cycle. And so again, this is the same as just a random walk in, in R. So definitely this, this support is too small to see the whole geometry of the hyperbolic plane. And so the, the, that theorem is generalization of, of this kind of thing. Axel, yeah. But again? At this point, the support of mu is countable. Yeah. There is a, yeah, the, the, yeah you, there is some generalization for, for non-countable support, but uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, other questions? What? A stabilizer of two points. An SL2. Yeah, yeah, but in SL2, what else can you do, right? So if you stabilize two points, yeah, you can swap, you can swap two points. Yeah, that's, uh, so is this still in SL2? Yeah, I guess this is still in SL2. That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the condition is, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. So this is times what, times E2? So, yeah, yeah, so the condition is you don't want to fix any finite set of points on the bottom, yes? Sorry? Yeah, it is orientation preserving, but you can rotate, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was uh, initially, uh, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so now let's, so what we really care about now is, as you could guess from the title, is the harmonic measure. So what is the harmonic measure? Well, it's the hidden measure of this random walk. Yes? Uh-huh. But it doesn't fix only one, how many boundary points? Okay, let's think about this later. Yeah, as usual, you never should add the examples in the second draft. You should stick to the original topic. <laughs> I wanted to make it more explicitly, but okay, anyways. Okay, okay, so, okay, so, so we define a hidden measure. Okay, so we define a hidden measure. Mu mu as just the following, the probability that your random walk will converge to particular subsets. So you just have A and you just wanna walk and what is the probability that it lands there? That's so and moreover, this, this hidden measure has this also called harmonic measure because it also has the following property. So note that mu mu is mu harmonic or mu stationary. Well, meaning that 
The following is true. So if you take the measure, so this measure is not invariant by the group action, but it's invariant on average. So you take mu of g, and you push forward the measure by your element. OK, so what's happening here is that the, yeah, so you see this is an invariance on average because you start with this measure, you push it forward by, by the group element, and then you're averaging over all possible choices and you get back the original measure. So this is as good as we can get because there would be no invariant measures usually on the boundary. OK, so the question here that will be addressed in the last talk would be, what are the properties of the hidden measure? In particular, well, in particular, yeah, we have already, so in, in a very particular case, if you, again, if you have this random walk on SL2, so SL2R, well, we know that, again, X is the boundary, is H or, or, or D or something, and then the boundary of X is, of course, a circle. So this is indeed the picture. And so, of course, uh, you know, what, uh, what is the other nice measure that we have? Well, we always have the Lebesgue. So in particular, is new mu in the Lebesgue measure class. Is it absolutely continuous or, yeah, or even in the same measure class as the Lebesgue measure? So I say in the same class because, in fact, the Lebesgue measure, the action, yeah, the Lebesgue measure and the heated measure, either they're absolutely continuous to each other or they're mutually singular to each other by algorithms. So it's on one or the other. And so the question is, in which case it is? Okay, and uh, right. So, for instance, can it be that, or even even uh, you know even weaker? Yeah, what is uh, what is the house of dimension? House of dimension. Of new meal. And what is the house of dimension? Well, in this case, if you have a nice group, so for this, we say, yeah, so, well, I'll say it in a second, what is the house of dimension, but, and so, so, so this problem has actually a long history, and it started a long time ago with, first, with Furstenberg. So Furstenberg, in some sense, solved this problem already in the following sense that he proved that for any lattice, for any lattice, I guess I have to call it G now, in SL2R, so discrete and finite co-volume, there is a mu measure on G such that new mu, uh, right, is in the same class as a Lebesgue measure. So in some sense, this is solved, that's it. And I mean, the reason why he was interested in this problem was for rigidity uh, type of theorems, because what they wanted to do was to compare the random walk on the lattice with, you know, for instance, the Brownian motion on the group. And in general, he wanted to study which lattices are as abstract groups, subgroups of certain Lie groups. And in order to do that, you have to you know, relate the lattice and the subgroup. And one way to do it is to use these measures on the boundary. And so the Lebesgue measure is reminiscent of the whole Lie group, and this is just supported on the lattice. 
Okay, however, there is a catch here. So, so what kind of measure does, so first, the way first of all produce this um, result is by discretization of Brownian motion. So this measure, mu, is produced. And in fact, there's a, also a paper by Lyons and Sullivan, is produced by discretization of Brownian motion. You can, you can think that if you define a Brownian motion with replaced to the Laplace Beltrami operator, then yeah, the Brownian motion, the, the kernel that defines it will be uh, symmetric under rotation. And so similarly, the measure that you would obtain in the end will have to be symmetric under rotation. And so the only measure that is symmetric under rotation would be the Lebesgue measure. So if you are able to discretize this Brownian motion by taking a tiling and taking the first heating time of the tiling and so forth, then um, you get some measure that does the trick. However, it support, so yeah, it, it, it support, the cardinality of the support of this measure would be infinite. So it would be infinite. So in some sense, it's not completely satisfying because we, we have to have this, this measure, which is spread, spread very, very, very far. It's not finitely supported. So what about for finitely supported? Yes? Yeah. Uh huh. I don't think it's quite that. I mean, because you cannot quite do that on a lattice. No, you don't. No, no. Now you have to go very far in the tessellation. So, so the way you 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 solve the situation is, you start at the tessellation, and 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 you you take you know the probability of hitting a certain tile, and you want to say that that. You know, you assign that the center of the tile as your next move. Yeah, but of course there's an error there. But the way you eventually recoup the error is by going further and further. And yeah. Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, maybe there's this other, pro yeah, I was familiar with this one, yeah, okay. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I will define it soon, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, okay, so. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, th I think you get absolute continuous, yeah. But uh, yeah, we have to check who, first of this paper. So, okay, so the point is, okay, so there is another way you can sort of cheat your way out of this problem by, and this was exp expressed by Burgan, who said the following. So what about if we do the, if we want this to be finitely supported? Well, so you can, so there exists mu finitely supported. on, um, right, on SL2R, such that the hidden measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. However, this, uh, there's another catch here. So however, here the group generated by the support, so if we say, if we call it, uh, uh, you know, G mu, which is the group generated by the support of mu, is not discrete. In fact, this construction is somewhat related to expander graphs, but um, it is somewhat arithmetic, but then the denominators are, are huge, and so the group that they generate is not discrete. So in some sense, you lose the geometry. When you take the quotient, you, you have something bad. And so that prompts the formulation of the probably correct conjecture, 
which again was, was preceding this result of Bourguin, but this result of Bourguin tells you that you need to impose certain conditions on this conjecture. So this conjecture is sometimes called the singularity conjecture. And this conjecture is somewhat old. So definitely Kaimanovich played a role in it. And I think this is uh, much older than the papers where it's actually written, but to have it really written up, it's in this paper of Kaimanovich and Le Prince. So, so this is around 2010, but this problem is, is, is actually much, much older, but it's not clear who exactly to attribute it to. But the point is the following, that for any finitely supported mu on SL2R such that the group generated by the support of mu is discrete, the measure nu mu is singular with respect to Lebesgue. So basically the conjecture is that you can never do this if you want to preserve both the geometries of the discreteness and the fact that this measure is finitely supported. And okay, by the way, also let me add another remark that there's a famous theorem of Le Drapier that says that if you instead look at Brownian motion, the situation is in a way nicer when you get very nice um, a very nice uh, rigidity result. So for Brownian motions, so if you allow yourself to consider variable curvature surfaces for Brownian motion on negative curvature surfaces, negatively curved surfaces, let's say, yeah, let's say co-compact, co co for instance, then the hidden measure is absolutely continuous if and only if the curvature is constant. Continuous if curvature is constant. So this is a different way you can, you can perturb your Brownian motion. So if you change the curvature, and then you never get the Lebesgue measure on the boundary. On the other hand, unless you have the original case, on the other hand, even if the geometry, the background geometry, the curvature is, is as good as it was, if you, if you discretize this, this Brownian motion by a finite, finite random walk, they, then you can never obtain an absolutely continuous motion. So what, so what is the, status of the conjecture, what are the so so there's two cases because it depends on this group generated by the support. So the the one case is the group generated by the support is, is not co-compact. So it, it has to be finite volume because, okay, if it's infinite co-volume, then the limit set is too small. So you could compare to the patterson sullivan measure, which also would make sense. But originally it was posed for SLDR. But since already the conjecture has to be revised once, I would stick to SL2R just to. <laughs> yes, because originally, to be honest, this, this counter example was not really in, the, in, in mind, but clearly they had in mind this geometric uh, case. So, yeah.
be my guest. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. No, yeah, yeah. It makes a, a, a lot of sense. I, I just want to keep the concrete case, which is already like tricky. Yeah. So if GMU is not co-compact, okay, so it but, but finite volume. So if it's infinite volume, somehow the limit set is too small, but the conjecture is not a problem. So now we consider M, which is the quotient of H on G mu. So this is some hyperbolic surface with the cusp, more, more than one cusp. So for instance, of course, example everybody likes is SL to Z, which is connected to number theory and other such modular curves are also of this type. Okay, in this case, the conjecture is known. And there are different possible approaches. So in fact, uh, starting with SL to Z, the original approach by Givarch and Legend, And then there's different teams of people that gave different proofs of, yeah, which generalize in various things. So for instance, the Ron Klepstein Navas and also Blacher, Asinski, Mathieu. And mo most recently, myself with Gadra and Mark, which also we have proof that generalizes to the action of mapping class group on Pike one space. But anyways, um, so this kind of conjecture is known. And uh, let me tell you what is the idea, why this is the case, the sketch in, the, in this cusp case. So the cusp really tells you a lot about the geometry of both the, the harmonic measure and the uh, you know, hyperbolic metric. And so here's the, here's the idea. So let's consider the simplest possible case. So let's consider two, the following two matrices, A equals, let's say, 1, 0, 1, 1, and B, 1, 1, 0, 1. So this is the simplest possible case. And in this case, and let's say let's take uh, let's take the one half, for instance. So now we can think of it in sort of uh, terms of number theory, so, so so to speak. So we have the Faraday tessellation because the action. So you have the hyperbolic. Uh, line between zero and infinity in the hyperbolic space, and then we consider the action. So we get of SL to Z there, then we get the Faraday tessellation. And it turns out that if X Xi is a point, which is a point on, on the boundary, is in, in the upper half plane model, is the limit of sequence of matrices like that. So let's see, let's say you do A bunch of times, A one times, and you do B bunch of times, and then you do A again, so forth. Well, it turns out that uh, this has a nice number theoretic interpretation because it, it's, it's the same as saying the Xi can be written in continued fractions like one over a one plus one over a two plus one over a three and so forth. And this is just uh, because these operations induce the elementary operations that are using, this is plus one basically, and this is uh, not quite, it's not one over x, but it's, it's uh, the correct. And so it turns out that here you can kind of estimate these measures easily. Because you see, what is the probability in the hidden measure? So here there's a random walk on a semi-group. So there's no backtracking. So this is kind of easier. So the random walk just goes through this tree structure, and it starts from here, say it chooses 
you know, left or right, according to which of these two matrices you pick. So if you pick A, you go left. If you pick B, you go right. And so here, the probability that, you know, A1, the first coefficient is say K, well, what is it? Well, this is just a random walk on two, two you know, three monoids. So you just, the probability of picking K consecutive A's is just exponentially small. It's two, minus, two to the minus K, this case. And in terms of the Lebesgue measure, well, what is the probability that, you know, if you take a random number, say between zero and one, it has the first coefficient of the continued fraction expansion to be K. What is it? You give a random number, what's the probability that this continued fraction expansion starts with K? What, what are such possible numbers? So it has to be that X starts with one over one plus K plus something, right? So it has to go from one over K plus one to one over K. And so this one is basically one over k squared. And so you see that these two, these two the k's are very different. So the, this, this walk that is only on the graph, you know, has decaying, exponentially decaying probabilities. But this walk that takes into account the geometry of this parabolic element, then it grows only uh, polynomially. And so this is clearly the hint why, why these two measures cannot be in the same class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was my uh, intuition. So this is the original intuition of Givash and Lejean for SL2Z, and then we, we did the same in general, yeah, exactly. So you look at the cusp excursion, yeah, if you want, I can say more about that. So, but basically, yeah, yeah. The idea is that uh, the, the random, uh, right, the, uh, if you take a random geodesic with respect to the harmonic measure, the cusp excursion is much smaller than if you take a random geodesic with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So this parabolic dynamics, uh, somehow it's, yeah, it has always this polynomial thing. And in fact, for instance, right, if you take the expectation of this, this would be infinite. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so in fact, this is related to the, to, the, to the curious fact, which I, okay, let me, let me say, is that for, for Lebesgue, almost every psi in zero one, if you look at the sum of the continued fraction coefficients, it's a corollary of this by applying the ergodic theorem. <laughs> this is what, well, this is the expectation of this. So this is the sum of k times one over k squared. So this is infinite. However, if you take the limit of the, of the, you know, geometric mean, instead of the arithmetic mean, this converges to, to a finite, constant, which is called Hinchin's constant. So this is, of course, this is very classical in a way, but you can generalize in, in other cases where you have the cusp, including the mapping class group where you, you still have a cusp on, on modular space. Okay, so. Okay, so let me finish also this, this example. Since I promised <laughs> Mohan this also note, the other thing you, you can note is that if you do this, well, the, the harmonic measure can be written as the push forward by the Minkowski question mark function of the, of the Lebesgue measure. And the, the Minkowski question mark function is just, is the map that maps A1, so a number which is written in continued fractions, it's, yeah, let's say we define it in, on zero. Yeah, we can define it either on zero one or on the whole 
uh, interval, let's say we define it on 0, 1, then, then we, we write a binary number which has this as coefficients. So, so basically, one, one, a one number of times, and zero, a two number of times, and so forth. And yeah, so this function is 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 a very interesting function, has this fractal properties, and it's definitely not the function. This is definitely not. Um, so this is a binary expansion. Yeah, it has very um, definitely not absolutely continuous. Okay, so this is the non cocon part case, which more or less is, is known. So this, the case two would be the cocon part case. And in this case, it, it's much, much harder. I mean, because, so first of all, we already saw that this decaying, you see here, you use the, the geometry of the cusp to say that this decay is polynomial. But in the cocon part case, the decay is always exponential, okay? Is exponential for both measures. Measures, so you cannot really tell apart. And yeah, the other thing which is related to this is that if you look at also, the, if you look at the inclusion of, of, of your group, G inside the hyperbolic plane, so you have G goes to GO. Well, this one is, is a quasi isometry. Is quasi isometry if we put, yeah, if we put here the word metric, so we put here the word metric and we put here the hyperbolic metric. In the, in the previous case, this group was virtually free. So, so with the word metric, so it would not embed quasi isometrically in the hyperbolic plane. But if this is a co compact lattice, then this is quasi isometric. So, in some sense, again, this harmonic measure knows about the groups, the, the graph structure, and the other one knows about the hyperbolic metric. But in this case, you cannot tell them apart in, by quasi isometrics because they are in the same class. Okay. So, okay, so now I'm ready to state the first main result I want to talk about, which is the singularity result. So how do we produce, how do we produce co-compact books and goods, co-compact lattices in SL2R? Well, We go back to the original idea of, of Poincaré, basically, which is we take a hyperbolic polygon, so for instance, an octagon, okay? And then we try to pair to construct the group that identifies a certain size. Okay, so, the actual uh, pairing that we consider is the following. So I write down already the setup for the theorem. So, so let P be a actually centrally symmetric. Hyperbolic two oh, I'm gone. So you need pairing. And we 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 want to consider this pairing, which is also you you know looked at a lot in Tagman space, which is supposing that the group that that the polygon is centrally symmetric on the so rotation of 108 degrees around the center. And then we can pair opposite sides. So we can, this group, this side has the same size of this side. So there will be a map 
let's call it T1, that identifies this side to this one, and so forth. So there will be this side will be the same size of this one. So there will be an identification between this and this by some other element in SL2R, which is T2, and so forth. So there will be this one identified with this one. And finally, this one identified with this one. Okay. So, yeah. So let T, which is T1, Tm, be hyperbolic translations. Identifying opposite sides. Of, um, of P. And also, we can also consider plus or minus because we can go one way or the other. Okay. Okay. So, so the theorem which will be the first I will talk about, which actually I will talk about in the last lecture, but which is with, by myself and PhD student Peter Kosenko, is that in this condition, if, yeah, if uh, G mu is, yeah, if, if G is the group generated by T is discrete, which by the way, can be checked by looking at the angles in this polygon. Those are Poincaré conditions. So basically, the sum of all the angles has to be a rational multiple of pi. There is some more combinatorial condition. No. No, no, no. I just need this. Yeah, that's it. No, no, no. They need not be on the circle. It is a restriction. I mean, the group. The Fuchsian group is hyperelliptic. In genus two, you get all of them, but in, in higher genus. So this is a somewhat a technical thing, of course, but uh, anyways, but, but we need it. <laughs> so, but we are allowed to, to change the geometry of, of the tiling in any other way. So we can change the geometry of the tiling as long as we keep the symmetry. And also we are allowed to change the, the weights that we give to this generator. But we fix, so we fix uh, the support of the measure to be this. So then, for any. They, they intersect at this point here. Yeah, this is very important, and you will see in the proof, it's important that the axis, they intersect each other. Because we want to apply a color line manager. Yeah. So then, for any mu supported, on T, yeah, the hidden measure new, new mu is singular with respect to Lebesgue. And in fact, more, but the limit set is everything, of course. Moreover, and I will give you the definition. Second, the house of dimension of this hidden measure is strictly Less than one. So you have a, a case of a classical case of dimension drop. You have measure such that its topological support is everything. But if you measure the dimension of the measure in the dynamical way, which then the dimension is less than one. So I will give you immediately the definition. Okay, and so in fact, the definition is that, so we note that, so note in this situation that, yeah, so if you take the limit as R goes to, to zero of minus log, the new of a ball of radius R on the boundary, with respect to say the standard metric on the circle minus log R, so this number will be our 
notion of local house of dementia. Yeah, so this exists. Uh, right, new almost sure. So, so for almost every boundary point, yeah, so this measure is 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 regular in a nice way. So so if you look at the risk, if you look at uh, some ball of, of radius r, then the measure of, of this ball will be the measure of the ball of radius r will be roughly r to this dimension. And and so this is almost surely the case. So this is a, yeah, proven maybe by Pierre or Tanaka, depending on the generalization you, you're looking at. But anyways, this always exists. And the problem is whether this is strictly less than. What? Uh, definitely finite, I think uh, definitely finitely supported measures. And then probably, yeah, for exponential. Yeah, yeah, co-compact for sure. It's for sure for the co-compact case, yeah. Yeah, for the co-compact case. For the non-co-compact case, uh, let's see. So if you have a lattice, maybe it's still fine, but uh, if you look at, because usually you have a shadow lemma, right? So if you want the something like, something like this, then you want something like R, the delta, this is the first term. But that could be some other other times. So if there's a cusp, there should be some other times there. If it's co-compacted, there's no other times in it. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So I think I'm out of time for today. So I'll 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 finish here. So tomorrow we will talk about the second problem, which is related to the identification of the Poisson boundary for. For instance, for hyperbolic groups. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, in here we are on the circle, so we can just take the usual metric on the circle. Otherwise, if you have a gamma hyperbolic group, there is a, there is a metric, of course. It depends on some epsilon, so the epsilon has to be taken into account in the definition. But, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think it's what do you mean doable. No, it's not obvious, but actually their paper is not very long. I mean, again, you look at the tessellation associated to the group. The basic idea is you look at, you know, when the Brownian motion hits some tile, with which, with, with which probability the Brownian motion hits some tile, and you assign it to, you know, to the group element, which is at the center of the style, this probability. But this is, but then, you, but you have to take a large, like, yeah, you have a tiling, and you have to take a large, much larger. Yeah, so you, you look at maybe a color like this. And you, yeah, you look at, uh, you know, there's a lot of tiles here. So you, you wait until you get there and so forth. So you do this at, at every level. And, and then somehow, yeah, I, 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 it's definitely not obvious. But uh, somehow, when you when you keep going, uh, the the different the, the errors that you make, somehow they can be weighted out. Yeah. Correct. Correct. No, no. It, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's not trivial, but the, the, the but the for, first the paper and also Lyon Sullivan paper is not extremely long. D, what is D? 
Oh, the generating set. Yeah, okay, good question. So, I don't think so. So, yeah, this is a, this is a good question that, um, so, so it seems like, right, so the best situation would be the most regular one. Yeah, I mean, if you add long, yeah, the thing is, if you add long generators, then the Lyapunov exponent should increase, and so the dimension should decrease, actually. And in fact, my original guess was that the best possible situation would be the regular poly polygon of certain size. And then we worked it out, and Peter in particular, and then the thing is, even if you take a po hyperbolic polygon with many sides, the situation gets better and not worse, actually. Because this polygon is still hyperbolic, so it's not like in... in, in in you know, Euclidean geometry, you can take a polygon with many sides, which somewhat approximates the circle. But in, in hyperbolic geometry, the discreteness sort of sort of forces your 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 polygon with many sides to, to somewhat look more like this. So you so it looks closer to the cusp case. So in some sense, I, the conjecture is the regular octagon with 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 <laughs> with a, a uniform measure should give you the highest possible value, but uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> so, so, in fact, the Polycat and Vitnova, they worked out the dimension in that case. So you can... You can so this is not effective, but it, with thermodynamic formalism, if you want to one specific group, there may be a way to get the dimension of this specific group. And they compute it and they... <laughs> So they have some bound for, for, for that particular case. But, yeah. but definitely, if you make the polygon more irregular, like you, you make one, yeah, one thing very long, well, then this will, will bring the dimension down. Yeah. Suppose you deform this in like so these are uh -huh. some pattern. Correct. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, this condition would be someone. Yeah, I think in this in this very hyperbolic situation, I, I think so. I mean if yeah. There is a problem when you, when the Lyapunov exponent goes towards zero, that then uh, there, there, there are counterexamples to this continuity. Oh, okay. Well, I just meant, okay, I, I don't want to say very, sp well, basically this, this thing. So if you, yeah, you, you have a shadow lemma for both. So basically you want to say that, you know, the, the take a ball, like that, take the Lebesgue measure of a ball of certain radius. Well, this clearly is our dimension. And the same is true. So basically, so this is the R to the eta, let's say. And this theorem says that these are not the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you have cusps, then, uh, you know, you, you, you get additional terms here because of the... Uh, Cusp. So, yeah. 